Our goal in developing the Wiener-Hoff equations, or normal equations, or Wiener equation, was to minimize the expected squared error in our estimate. So we ended up with an expression <coughs> that looked something like this. Uh, our expected squared error had uh, the variance of our, the quantity that we're trying to predict, d. It also had our filter weights times uh, the cross-correlation between d and our input y and an expression containing the autocorrelation of our input. You might notice I've changed the h's we used in the previous slide to w's here, and that's because for some reason, I could conjecture that maybe it's because w, or Wiener starts with w, um, or maybe because w uh, is the beginning letter in weights, and these are called filter weights, but for whatever reason, it's common to use W's when talking about Wiener filters. So we'll just go with the flow and do the same thing. So here's our expression for the expected error. We're going to do two things in this lecture. One, we're going to explore what this looks like so we can get a little bit of intuition for what's going on. And two, we'll look at our optimal error, or when we've minimized the error, what is that error and what does it depend on? So we'll start by looking at a few 2D examples and where our weight vector is uh, w naught and w1. And every error surface will look different uh, depending on the parameters that we have, but here's a typical one. This would be here. Uh, what we're plotting is um, our error as a function of the weight vector and which is also uh, our error is uh, en squared but uh, e squared is going to be of course a function of our weight vector. The minimum is going to occur somewhere right down in there. We can't see it uh, unless we were to rotate this plot I think but we can see where it would be. And so correspondingly, the minimum weights, I don't know exactly what they are in this case, <coughs> are going to be something like that. So we often indicate the weights uh, as with a, and, and I'm sorry, it can be confusing. Sometimes we indicate them with a star, sometimes with a, uh, a knot, and sometimes with the subscript opt. I've also seen the star as a superscript, <clears throat> which uh, we typically reserve as notation for a complex conjugate. And so it can get a little bit confusing depending on which, uh, which text or paper you're reading. Uh, and you have to figure out from context exactly what's going on. So another thing to notice, as uh, the error is a quadratic equation, and this appears to be a 2D quadratic. So here's another example. Uh, this example is also quadratic. You can see, although it looks like a sheet of paper that's been uh, folded gradually by picking up two corners, you can also see that the left and the right corners are uplifting uh, slightly. It's a quadratic surface, but obviously it's uh, stronger uh, in one direction than another. Our first example, you can see by looking at the contours that are projected underneath the plot, appear to be almost circular. In this example, they would be very elongated, in our new example, very elongated ellipses. Okay, so now let's go back and figure out what the uh, optimum um, error is. We know how to find the optimal weights like so. And the big question on everybody's lips is, what is the minimum error? Well, let's go ahead and just plug in what we know. We have our optimal weights, so we'll plug them into our expression for our error. Okay, so we have our 
error equation from before. And all we've done is replaced our generic w's with the optimal ones by changing the subscripts. But let's go a little bit further. What can we tell from this? Well, recall that uh, ry times w optimal is equal to rdx or rdy rather and uh, that's simply using the uh, uh, equation our Wiener equation which is uh, that ryw is equal to rdy so now this term and this term have the same w op transpose rdy minus 2 in the first instance and plus 1 in the second so this just falls right out as minus w op transpose times rdy so That's our minimum error. A few comments here. We will investigate some of these further. But for right now, notice that the minimum solution does not depend on ry. It only depends on rdy. I should, I should change the minimum error. The solution, of course, implicitly depends on ry because that's where we get our opt. However, the, uh, the minimum error is influenced only by the cross-correlation between uh, d and y. And that makes some sense. It tells us that the amount of information uh, between that is shared uh, or the amount of correlation between d uh, are value that we're predicting and why our input is going to have a big impact on how well we can do. If they were completely uncorrelated and zero mean, then our dy would be zero. And this would tell us that our minimum error is going to be just the variance of the quantity we were trying to estimate. To the extent that it's anything, uh, that there's any correlation, we can decrease the error from that uh, minimum uh, from the just the variance of our uh, uh, target prediction or prediction target. Next, we have these two error surfaces that we showed up above and looked at. One of them is it looks like a nice bowl, and the other one uh, looks like a a long glacier valley or something. The shape of that is determined by Ry, the autocorrelation of y. So we will see this when we start looking at ways of approximating or finding solutions. That uh, the one on the left, where it's very bowl shaped, is much better behaved because the minimum stands out dramatically. The one on the right, as you can see, the uh, there are a lot of areas where we're close to the minimum, but not, exact, not exactly there. Okay, now we're going to look at one other important concept for gaining intuition here, and that is this idea of excess error. So I've copied again uh, our expression uh, for our expected error. And now let's see how things change when we are close to, but not on uh, our optimal solution. Close to our, our expected, or rather optimal, but not exactly there. So here we've taken the liberty of uh, adding and subtracting the same quantity uh, to the same side of the equation, should, which should not change the overall value, but doesn't change our, interp our interpretation somewhat. This right here, we've added uh, 
w opt transpose times rdy, and we've subtracted the same thing. And we already know, that from looking right above, that that is e min. So we have e min, and then over here we have this uh, other uh, quantity expression. So let's simplify that a little bit and see where it takes us. And let's hope it doesn't take us very long to do so, because I'm almost out of page here. So we have e min, and now we're going to do the same thing. In fact, let's go ahead and do it up here. We're going to do the same thing. We're going to add. OK, so now we're going to do some substitutions. We already know that rdy is equal to um, ry times w opt. And so that shows up here and here. Let's go ahead and make those substitutions. OK, so we notice here that we have two uh, quadratic terms with w. One is with w opt, w opt transpose times ry, w opt. And the other is with w. That's over on the right, w transpose ry, w. Then in the middle, we have a minus 2 times a cross term. So this is going to be uh, easily factorable into something that looks like e min plus, and then we'll get w opt minus w, ry times uh, w opt minus w. So now let's define <coughs> delta w to be that difference. Because w opt minus w, of course, is going to be the degree to which w, any particular weight, differs from our optimal. And that will give us a final expression of e min plus delta w transpose ry delta w. Like so. Two things to note. Obviously, we're going to have uh, a minimum error of e min, so that'll be our, our offset. And the error increases quadratically as we move away from our optimal solution with our delta w's. And the other thing is, up above, our minimum error solution did not depend on directly on our y, but here it does. So our y determines how quickly the error grows as we move away. So in these two examples, uh, plots that we show here, uh, if we have an ry that is has eigenvalues that are very similar, we'll end up with a plot like the one on the left, the bowl-shaped one. And in that case, no matter what direction we move away, the error is increasing uh, accordingly and quadratically. On the right, we have an ry where the <coughs> Uh, eigenvalues of ry, <coughs> excuse me, differ uh, substantially. And so the direction that we move away from the optimal matters. 
as well. There are some directions where the error simply does not increase very much, and other directions where the error does increase. So how would you see that by looking at this equation down here? Well, suppose that delta w, our uh, degree of uh, deviance from our optimal solution, actually was an eigenvector of ry, and that ry had an eigenvalue of 100 and an eigenvalue of 1. If we differed in the direction at the eigenvalue, I'm sorry, if we differed with an eigenvector associated with the eigenvalue of 1, then the amount of difference is not going to be amplified very much by ry. On the other hand, if delta w was in the same direction as the eigenvector associated with an eigenvalue of 100, a small deviance would include now a large gain in the error. We'll revisit this some more later.